This is Big Ideas from the ABC. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Byrne, and um, it's a great pleasure to be with you here tonight in this very beautiful venue. Um, it's also an interesting time to be here, I think, during an election campaign when, as I'm sure quite a few of you have noticed, really we're going for small targets rather than uh, big ideas. And uh, such is the luxury of, uh, of living in an affluent Western country. Um, but by extreme contrast, here we have as our guest tonight, Somali-born Ayan Hirsi Ali. A big target with uh, such big and challenging ideas that um, they put her very life at risk. Uh, she's been called the bravest woman in the world. She's also been called a traitor, or uh, the insult that she's turned into a badge of courage, an infidel. Beyond doubt, she's a very extraordinary woman, and uh, though just 40 this year, she's already lived many lives, and we are privileged to have her here with us tonight to tell us about them. So please, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please welcome Anne Hosiari. Now, I'd like to start, Anne, if we may, not at the very start, but sort of we might call the, um, the early middle. Okay, so you're, you're in your late teens, 17 or 18, you're living uh, in Nairobi, attending uh, school, and you are as pious and dutiful a Muslim as you can possibly imagine. You're reading the Quran, you're praying five times a day, you're wearing the hijab, you even think that actually the fatwa on Salman Rushdie is a good thing and should be carried out. What sowed the seeds of doubt? Um, the seeds of doubt come to mind in, you know, the everyday life. Things like the way my brother is treated. We get uh, fast sister Aziza, the woman who introduced me to radical Islam, or rather to political Islam, political dimension of Islam, but also Bokal Saum, whom I discuss in Infidel. And it's all about an awakening of how to be a good Muslim. And I want, desperately want to be a good Muslim. So yeah, I do cover myself, I pray, I attempt to do all the good things that you're supposed to do. And in some of these discussions, we're told, as a woman, you have to obey your husband. And do as he says, bow. And there's just this natural question that is, but what about him? Does he have to obey me? Why doesn't he cover? And it's questions like that that first emerge in my mind. I don't have any answers for them. But I don't even as you were praying and, and being dutiful, yeah. you had these thoughts in your mind. Where did they come from, though? I think Other that's, people didn't have those thoughts in their mind. I think they did. I think they did. I think that those questions are natural. You look at your siblings. Um, a sibling gets a toy. You don't get it. You question yourself, hey, why? So the question of equality is a universal question. Uh, sometimes it's a question of jealousy. Why do you have something that I want to have that I don't have? And the Quran doesn't answer that question. The Imam who is translating the Quran to us, the authority figure, doesn't deal with it in a satisfactory way. And I have a, and I have a different conversations and doubts, and I talk about that in Infidel, where I say, okay, I think the teacher is just stupid. It's mm. him. It's not the Quran. It's not the Prophet Muhammad. So I'm not at the stage where I'm questioning scripture. I'm not questioning. Muhammad as the authority figure. I'm just questioning this guy who comes in and who says, well, he has the right to beat you, he, you, have, you, know, you have to obey him, etc., etc. My doubts increase when I help a distant uncle, cousin. I use the word distant in the Western context. In the Somali context, we're all cousins 
who takes me, who asks me to go with him to the border between Somalia and Kenya to fetch his family. And while there, and it's about a period of two weeks, I see things that horrify me. It's the spectacle of war, people who fled war. And the first vision of what you see are people who come to me and look at me and all say, get me out of here. So first I'm confronted with my own powerlessness. And I can't help but think, I'm going to pray for you, but in that praying for you, I think, but you know, why do I need to be the transmitter of the message? Why can't God just do something about it? And then it follows, and there are people who want, and everything is scarce, water is scarce. People are drinking water that are filthy. People are doing things that are wrong. I think you, you shouldn't start fights. Um, these are the most basic ideas of hygiene. But you know, talking about that seems kind of trivial. There's one day, in this attention in, under the trees, we are camping under trees. There's a woman who's raped by the Kenyan police. The Kenyan police are infidels, they are Christians, but they are in power. My natural response is, we've got to help them. They're bleeding. This is one woman, but there was another woman also in another tent, but the first woman, we've got to help her. And that's not the response of everybody around. Everyone I go to to say, we've got to help this woman, we've got to bring her water, we've got to do something, say, oh no, don't go near her. You are the daughter of Hersi Magan. If you go anywhere near that tent, you're going to be filthy, tainted, smeared. Don't go anywhere near her. And I get ever more desperate and think, gee, all that I've been taught in my life depend on the clan, depend on God and God's mercy and compassion. Where's God's mercy and compassion for this woman? Mm -hmm. She was raped, it's not her fault. She is dying and the general idea seems to be let her die. So and that's the first woman and then there's the second woman and it's the general idea again seems to be let her die. So it was, it was an ongoing yeah. series. Then, when you were 22, came the Open Rebellion. When, when you were, that, that, was that the first real Open Rebellion? When you were, you'd been betrothed to this man arranged by your father, and you were going, and you ran, you basically ran to Holland. Is that was that the first really open break? Um, and I just because if so, what I would I say, what on earth were you thinking as you did that? You know how you can sometimes work for a big company and you find yourself not agreeing with the principles of the big company and you don't act? You look at your boss in the eye and you think, hmm, but you don't do anything about it because he's your boss, you could be fired. And when one of the policies affects you, you start to act on your own. It was like that with my father. <laughs> you know, he represented the the clan, that's a big entity, that's something beyond me. Then there's the religion and everything. And just traveling, completely obeying my father, going from Nairobi to Dusseldorf, from Dusseldorf in Germany to Bonn, doing everything that I was told to. I saw this little window of opportunity and I started to toy with the idea that I could fly out of it. You may have that at work, you may think, hmm, I can just, you know, quit. And I'll face the consequences some other time. But I did for that. Some, but for someone with your background, someone who'd been trained into subservience, as you said, it wasn't just like, you know, we can go and leave, leave a bad employer. You were breaking everything you'd ever known. I did because everything around me was breaking. When I was born, in 1969, the system that I was born under, newly established an independent state with its flag and its army and its identity had just broken. The country was seized by a dictator. So I am born into a broken system. My mother had left 
her first husband because she felt she wasn't going to be happy with him and didn't want to defy the strictures of religion and clan. She met my father and with him she had three children. She was his second wife and my father somehow managed to communicate to her that when it came to prioritize between his political ideals and having a family with her, the priority was his political ideals. So that idea of the family was also broken. We go to Saudi Arabia, and in Saudi Arabia, you see a tr modernity trickling in and the resistance to it. Everything was, in a way, not breaking down as fast as things were breaking down in Somalia, but Saudi Arabia is established on the logic of Sharia law. And Sharia law can only be sustained if there's no outside temptation. And at the time we lived in, Saudi Arabia was being bombarded with temptation. There was television, um, there was great food, there was gossip, there were soaps. You know, there were all kinds of things that challenged the system. We go to Ethiopia. The Ethiopians and the Somalis are fighting, and I find that everything around us is also breaking down. I go to Kenya, people have ideals, and then there's the reality, and there is almost no connection between that. So I grew up with uncertainty, with things breaking down. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. It can bring you death, it can bring you disease, but it can also bring you opportunity and an escape. And at that time, I, I just thought, knowing what I knew, I was going to take that train from Bonn to Amsterdam and see what happens. Just a, a quick personal question. Was it because you'd met this man that you were marrying and you just thought he was a bit of a, what we in Australia call a droob, a bit of a, a, bit of a useless <laughs> object, or because you didn't want to be told what to do by the master of the board, i.e. your father? Which was, which was the stronger impulse? Um, I think if my father had introduced me to Neil Ferguson there, I would have said yes. <laughs> Great. But That's he didn't. That's so romantic. <laughs> That's so romantic. But that obviously things don't work that, that yeah. way and that didn't happen. But what was clear to me was the stark reality that if I had gone with that man, his name is Osman and lives in Canada, I was going to replay my mother's life and the lives of all these other women I had seen in desperation, in powerlessness, in hopelessness, become a baby machine for a man I didn't want to be with. And in the years that my father was absent between 1982 to 1991, I had the opportunity, A, to see women who had gone through that same kind of powerlessness. Little girls, 17, 18, 16, some of them even 15, who were married off by their parents, and I saw them two or three years later and I didn't want to look like them or be mm. like them. Uh, B, um, all these stories we were being told about men are going to protect you and God is to protect you and religion, that bubble was burst uh, by the civil war in Somalia when Push came to shove up, mm. yeah, because of the chaos. Nobody was there to protect you. In fact, women were doing all the work and no one was protecting them. They were being exploited. If you were raped, if you became a victim of circumstances, there was no one there for you. So given all of that, it seemed to me at that time more attractive to bolt into the unknown rather than comply with what I knew was going to come. You went to Holland, um, I mean, you worked as a cleaner for a while. It was obviously very tough, very, very tough, and, and you write about that at length in Infidel, what it was like there. Um, you studied, you studied like crazy. But you also went and worked um, with, uh, in refugee centres, in asylum centres, battered women, abortion clinics and so on. You went, women, many of them Somali women, who were fleeing this chaos. And the, I wondered, it seemed to me that that in a way was your real education, not just what you did at the university, that that's what your views, that's where the bedrock is, that you saw what it was like for people who hadn't fled and that that really made you not just upset but very angry. Is that right? 
it, yeah, it was a very, very important part of my education, a very important part of my experience, not to be, uh, you know, there's the whole part about I take the train and I go and my family is angry and my father tells me he's angry, etc., etc. And I do all of that. And uh, the Dutch authorities at the time say, well, if you don't want to comply with this, you know, you don't want to go with this man, you can call the police, and as long as you comply with the police, you don't have to go with them. And I show through my determination, I don't want to go with him. So that part becomes kind of easy. But then you have to fall on your own self. And so then comes the cleaning, and the cleaning, doing all, all kinds of odd jobs. Cleaning was just one part of it, going to, you know, going through the struggle of having to live in a free society. I found that rewarding. It was hard in a way, but it was rewarding, and I learned a lot. What I found difficult was observing other women, some of them born in Holland, some of them um, as immigrants, who were not imprisoned physically because they could make use of the same opportunities that I had, call the police. Uh, there's a woman called Sylvia who called the police on behalf of me, and there were many Sylvias, but they wouldn't do that. They were arguing when you try to help them out of a situation of pure subservience. They would say, it's Allah who willed it. So there's a woman who's forced into marriage by her father. She is beaten up by her husband. She comes into a woman's shelter. I'm there to translate for her. The Dutch authorities say, we can help you out of this if you want to be helped out. And she says, well, I've got to make a calculation. It's not just my husband, but it's also Allah. We are all going to die. And in the hereafter, I don't want Allah to burn me in hell for the rest of my life because I disobeyed my husband. And I'm then faced with just how difficult human psychology works, and that it's not only I'm going to open the gates of the cage and you flee, but it's I'm going to stay in the cage because I've come to internalize what the cage is all about. Yes. Uh, it was also, I mean, this was, and uh, moving from the kind of more personal to the to the, actually the principle, this was when a, a time, very, great time of great upheaval in Holland. But, you know, let's face it, in Australia, um, we too are having debates about multiculturalism. This was the policy of multiculturalism. And is this when, um, when you started really questioning what had been, what, which was at that time very strongly the liberal Dutch policy that basically you took in um, uh, refugees uh, and you allowed them to maintain their values and principles within that society. This is what we also do here as you know, tell us why you believe, you said in, in your books you describe multiculturalism as a form of racism. Um, we think it's a form of generosity and understanding. Yeah. It's a form of generosity and understanding to the perpetrators of, um, you know, the perpetrators in subjecting weak parties, women and children, to a system in which they derive a very temporary fulfillment. I say temporary because I can't imagine Muslim men um, thinking that that is a permanent fulfillment for this world. Their children are brought up by women who haven't gone to school, who have been oppressed, and an ignorant mother is not a good mother. For From the perspective of the women who are oppressed in a, within a liberal society and who were denied their rights, they didn't see it as respect. They didn't see it as, um, you know, respect for their religion or their way of life. There was this passive attitude that if you saved them out of that system, some of them would think it's Allah who willed it. If you didn't, it was also Allah who willed it. But there were a few individuals amazing individuals who, during my years as a translator, during my years as an asylum seeker, my years as a translator, my years as a member of parliament, would come out of that system, and who for some reason walked into the wrong person, full of ideas of cultural relativism, and they were given back, they were put back 
in the situations where they continue to be oppressed because their fathers or their husbands or their uncles, their cousins were respected for doing so. The argument from those who are respecting was always, you know, we don't want to impose our Western Eurocentric values on the newcomers. Uh, there must be something good about female genital mutilation. There must be something about the dynamics within a Muslim family that we don't understand, and it could be something good. And it was an exemption and an excuse that the Catholic family wouldn't get, or the Orthodox Jewish family wouldn't get, or the very Orthodox Protestant families wouldn't get. And the more excuses we made for Muslim families, the more I thought this is a reverse racism where you're excusing all kinds of bigotry and um, entrenching very low expectations. And the more you look at it and you look at the result of individuals who grow up in oppressive Muslim families within liberal societies, so you're saying to me, it's the liberal society's responsibility? Is no, that your no, 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 it to cannot, no. To no, write no. it? No, it's not the responsibility. It's not the responsibility of liberal society. But liberal societies enable, enhance, ignore what is going on. It, it, you can never say it, an oppressor, the person who m makes the decision to take away the rights and freedoms of others, it's that person's responsibility, but it's also the responsibility of the victim who should, I find, make at least one attempt to get away. And sometimes you don't have that opportunity. For those oppressed in a liberal society, there is a great deal of opportunity that people who are oppressed in non-free societies simply don't have. I just want to describe where the two, there is, there is a dynamism where, let me give you an example. I think an example works better. Um, I am a Muslim woman. My father wants to marry me off at the age of 15. I go to school. I tell my school teacher, I'm afraid that my father is going to marry me off, but I want to continue with my education. My teacher says, oh great, we're going to talk to your father and we're going to talk all this nonsense out of his head. The father comes in and he tells the teacher, if you even go so far as to say what you've just said, I'm going to um, file a complaint with the anti-discrimination organization there. The teacher then thinks, I didn't want to ask for this kind of thing and backs away. A week later, the student doesn't show up. The teacher knows why the student doesn't show up. The student writes to her mentors, she writes to her teachers, she emails, she gets no response. That's what I mean. Mm. It's not the responsibility of the teacher that this girl is married off by her father, put in a situation that she doesn't want to, denied her education, raped by a man she doesn't want to be with. It's not the teacher's responsibility. But there is something within a liberal society that that teacher could have done. Okay. Well, if, if that time of Holland kind of really started to form your views towards multiculturalism, which you expand uh, in your later writings, particularly in Nomad. It was 9-11. It was, it, was, it was 2001, wasn't it, when the towers went down in America, which really sharpened your views towards the religion itself. Because, um, you said you, f you looked at the photograph of Muhammad Atta, the chief of that outrage, and you said uh, you, you felt you knew him. In fact... It, it could have been you if you'd been a man. He left a note behind, among other things, and that, that note was published. And that note is a prayer that if you w were brought up as a Muslim, you said many times over. The prayer was so familiar. Um, the desire to die as a martyr. But not only that, the implication that you didn't only die as a martyr, but you know if you read that prayer that you should also follow in his footsteps. And following in his footsteps doesn't mean you have to bring down tall buildings yourself, but it means that you can help people who want to bring down tall buildings built by the infidels by giving them a variety of uh, different forms of support. You can contribute money. 
yeah, you can pass on a message. You, as long as you feel that you're contributing to the jihad, yeah, I recognized it. And the question for me at that time, and I think it was a question that many Muslims who had to face uh, on the 12th of September 2001 was, do I go down that path, condone what happened, and contribute? Do I you know, become apathetic? And many, many, many Muslims became apathetic after that. I feel that apathy was, in fact, um, the best way out of the cognitive dissonance that the perpetrators of the 11th of September 2001 created in the Muslim mind. And then there were a few people who thought, no, I just simply don't agree with this. But then you couldn't stop your logic and your thinking only by saying, I don't agree with the perpetrators. You had to think the principles through, look at the scripture, look at and define the concept of jihad for yourself, what is the concept of my God? What is he telling me? Is there a God? Is there a hereafter? Are there angels? Are there prophets? Etc. Etc. And if you took that question to its logical conclusion, you might come up with the answer that I came up with, which is all nonsense. It's just a, a source of power. You're talking about a mental process. Did it give it's you a, yeah. pain, though? Did it give you pain in your heart? It gave me later, it, it gave me a relief an intellectual relief. I mean, I was so relieved that there was no hereafter because there would be no hell. I wouldn't burn. Life was only what you were living at that time. If you ran under, you know, in Amsterdam, you have lots of trams and we use, if you run under a tram and you die, that was it. So you make the most of your life. Uh oh, we have trams too. You have trams too. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get sick, you can, but then life is life on earth here. So there's that part, there's the relief. And there is the dependence on your reason. And I started to read more and more about the enlightenment thinkers that in the past I read, yes, out of some interest, but also just to get my exams, uh, my points, <laughs> with, with, you know, new, uh, with new eyes. Um, so there was the relief. The agony came with the consequences that with the conclusion I had reached, I couldn't just be the natural daughter of my father and my mother and my clan. I couldn't come home and say, hey, mom and dad, um, there's no hell. There's no hereafter. The Prophet Muhammad, oh, he's just a you know, fool from the seventh. You couldn't do that. You knew that you were going to be you know, disowned. Uh, and not, the disownment is something you can face, but it is the pain that you cause them, the pain that I cause my mother every day. Still? Still. You still feel it? Yeah. The pain, the embarrassment. Um, you know, in a collectivist society, it's not who you are from the inside, but it's what the people around you say. And my mother getting all these nasty looks, uh, that's some of the things that I think about my father, who's you know, made for himself this whole reputation being told, mm, your daughter is an infidel. That, that is, that's where Even though the you think they're wrong, you still feel bad about it. Yeah, because you don't, you don't want your family, you don't want those people who are closest to you to be um, put in a position of embarrassment. Well, given that you knew that would happen, you know, once you basically became an infidel, mm. you knew that would happen, the security detail came in by about, you know, within a year of 2001. It was the September 2002. Um, so you were under watch. Uh, you were rising through the ranks of the parliament. Um, you couldn't actually even see people freely. You, you'd swapped um, your religion for, for another kind of prison. Uh, did you never just think, I, I don't need to do this. Yeah, I could just back off now. You know, I've, I have, I've formed my view, I've, re I've released my mind. Um, let's just make it a bit easier on myself. I did and I do um, on a constant basis. Um, I mean, hey, I wish we lived in a world without uh, a threat from radical Islam. But you keep think 
you have these feelings of, oh God, I just want to you know, get on with life without having to consult a bunch of men carrying guns. But you think about that and then you think, but we do live in this reality. This is the threat. Um, I have committed to give my, contribu to my contribution to the best of my knowledge. I could be wrong. I wish I am wrong. I hope I am wrong. What are you wrong about? About my analysis. I hope, I hope that it's just a fringe group. I hope that they are harmless. I hope that this is all going to disappear. I hope that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad of Iran is not going to develop a nuclear bomb. I hope that we don't have, you know, you, we all, I, I don't know how many of you travel as often as I do, but every time I go to the airport and we have to go through these crazy, ridiculous um, screening at the airport, I just hope it's because in a liberal society, people have nothing else to do except to screen us in that way. Mm -hmm. I hope that, but I know better. And knowing better, and knowing that there is this confrontation between the moral system in which I grew up and the moral system that I've come to adopt, um, I'm actually glad that in this context, I am a player and that I can contribute with my knowledge from then and my knowledge here to, uh, I don't want to use the words bridge, dialogue or a better understanding. <laughs> because yeah, those terms have been, uh, have been utilized for results that I don't agree with, but at least an opening of the minds and the eyes of people, whether they grew up like me in an Islamic context or in a secular context, secular Western context, secular Christian context, that the threat we face is a real threat and that it is something that we can win. And not only by military means, but also by competing with the ideas that brought someone like Mohammed Atta the leader of the 9-11 um, contingent of 19 men, to opt to live and lead a career as an architect instead of that of a terrorist. But if, as you say, you write, there is a civil war within Islam, if there is a civil war, why wouldn't you choose to back the, to use a silly phrase, the friendly group, the moderate group, over the militants like Muhammad Apatow, rather than saying, as you say, there is no moderate. There is no... And that, I think, is the most challenging thing for a lot of people in your books, that you say... The, and you, and you, you're saying it more and more powerfully as time goes on. Yeah. Don't believe in this dream of moderate Islam. It is all much of a muchness. It doesn't exist. But if there is a civil war... There must be a better side. Why wouldn't you work with them rather than rejecting it all? I, I, I just want to move away from the word moderate because it's become a catch-all term that means all sorts of things to many different people. Like a bridge. Like the word bridge. It's become meaningless. But let's go back in history to the time when Christianity was radical and intolerant and bloody and dark and rejected science and rejected critical thinking and people had to learn by rote and power was concentrated in the hands of a few clergymen and a few secular politicians who used religion, Christian religion as a source of power. In those days, in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, individuals at that time who did argue for enlightenment, who questioned things, and at the time they didn't carry labels such as moderate or extreme, but those individuals were all labeled atheists, deities, all kinds of funny things. Some of them were burned at the stake Fast forward to now, when the demography of Muslims in the world is huge. When the leadership 
of Muslims in countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, power is concentrated in the hands of a few. And there are fanatics just as uh, at the time, 14th, 15th centuries in Christianity. And the grassroots fanatics and the autocrats who and the clergymen that they use all say no to critical thinking. The few people who do ask questions, whether they remain in the faith or whether they leave it like me, are all labeled heretics and atheists and all kinds of things. Then the answer to your question is, I support anybody who puts a question mark on anything in the Quran that we are supposed to digest as the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I support anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, who questions the morality of pro the Prophet Muhammad. But that person and me share one thing. By the fundamentalists and by the clergymen in Saudi Arabia, we're not identified as moderates, we're identified as heretics. There's Irshad Manji from Canada who calls herself a moderate Muslim and wants to open the gates of Ijtihad. She also walks around with bodyguards. She's protected and she's called an infidel. I am labeled an infidel. It really doesn't matter. Nasr Abu Zayed attended the university. No, he was given refuge in the university that emancipated and enlightened me in Leiden, an Egyptian a devout Muslim, he died recently. His whole point was, let us read parts of the Quran in the context of the seventh century, and there are parts of the Quran that are outdated. By saying that, he was kicked out of Egypt. There were people who wanted to marry him. He was forced to divorce his wife by the state. This is a devout Muslim. He was called an atheist. I am called an atheist. It really doesn't matter. You could be an atheist, you couldn't be an atheist. You could be a modern Muslim, you could be a not so modern Muslim. Criticizing Islam earns you the same labels, negative labels, as it did Christians in the 14th and 15th centuries. The point is, are we going to be intimidated by that or are we going to move on? I choose to ignore criticisms of being an infidel because I am an infidel. I am an infidel to the morality of Prophet Muhammad. I am an infidel to the Quran. There's no point in denying that. And in the 21st century, when people are literate, they can read, they can write, they can see for themselves what I am an infidel to, I am proud to say I'm an infidel. But isn't there hope to be found if you look at a country like Sorry, I didn't mean to stomp on you. <laughs> Isn't there hope to be found if you look at Indonesia, for example, with something like, I think, 200 million Muslims? Yes, they have um, uh, terror cells within. I mean, you know, our police work with their police. They are uh, they're not encouraged from... Um, it's not like Pakistan, where there's this unholy alliance from within the security agencies with their, <laughs> with their groups. Um, isn't that hope for another way, where... There is a place where you wouldn't have to live under security, where in fact a degree of challenge would be permitted. There are other ways to do Islam, aren't there? No? <laughs> <laughs> She's got looking actually quite pitying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's very important for us to make a distinction between Islam on the one hand and Muslims on the other hand. Muslims as adherents to the faith do that in different degrees. The faith itself, again, I go back to the Quran, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, the jurisprudence given by scholars down the road, and you'll find a difference in uh, who is to be the true caliph after the Prophet Muhammad. That is a, that's the main difference, theological difference between the Shias and the Sunnis. The Shias believe that it has to be someone in the bloodline of the Prophet. The Sunnis believe to be the person who's most virtuous or most capable. The word, the Arabic word for that makes no distinction of that. That's the theology. Then there's Islam. People who are born into it, who are told to identify with it, who are taught to believe that the Quran is the true word of God, even though they haven't read it. 
people were taught to believe that Muhammad is a perfect, perfect man and he left a perfect morality behind it, even though he doesn't know. And we are now going up to 1.57 billion people and counting. Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey were famous as non-Arab countries in being very moderate or very mild in how much of that theology they apply to their private lives, their community lives, their social lives, and their political lives. And they used to be famous and still are to a certain degree and being different from Arab countries. Um, uh, Malaysians, Indonesians, Turks are seen to have, as populations, found some kind of reconciliation between Islamic theology and modernity. That's been tested and was tested for the last 20 years. And what you see is that radical Islam, the political and social dimension of the theology, has taken root in Islam, uh, in Indonesia, is spreading slowly, and it has both the grassroots dimension and the top-down dimension, and that all three countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Turkey, are moving toward a more radical, Sharia-like society, even though they have not implemented or don't seem to be planning to implement Sharia law. There seems kind of a big gap also between those countries where you stone women who've been um, uh, accused of adultery. And in Indonesia, there's no suggestion of anything like that. The prisons aren't pretty. but they... There is a suggestion of that. There's a suggestion of it not so much by the state, but by fundamentalist groups who are large enough to conduct in Indonesia and in Malaysia floggings and different parts of Sharia, and the state can do everything about it, and the state is doing nothing about it. And just as a reminder, a country like Iran, it wasn't so that from one day to the next they applied Sharia. The subscription to the idea that Islam is the answer and the introduction of Sharia law is going to bring us into a very just society was gradual and everyone ignored it. When Imam Khomeini appeared in his garb and started preaching about everything that the Shah was doing wrong and everything that Western countries were doing wrong and he offered a third way, the Iranians in the 1960s and the 1970s thought, hmm, he has a point, one point, two, three people, 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, a million people, and before you knew it, and this is what's so interesting about Iran, Sharia was not a top-down um, uh, enterprise. Mm -hmm. It was a bottom-up enterprise. People subscribed to it. They voted for it. That kind of a dynamic is possible in Turkey. It's possible increasingly in Indonesia and in Malaysia. So we can all lie back and say, these countries are different. They're not like Saudi Arabia. They're not like Afghanistan. They're not like Somalia. But if nothing is done, if that movement is not resisted, argued with, if the population is not shown over and over again that a Sharia-led society is not going to be a society under justice, it's going to be a society where as women you can be flogged and stoned, where as men your hands can be amputated and uh, it's going to be a society of systematic violations of human rights, it's not going to bring justice, it's going to bring economic disaster and military disaster, you're going to have confrontations with other countries. If we don't go and give that message, and I'm talking about as Indonesians, as Malaysians, as Turks, then the, the likelihood that these countries will face the same predicament that Iran faces is not something that I want to rule out. What do you actually fear will happen? What is your worst anticipation? It depends on where. In a country like Turkey, my worst fear is it's going to be torn by the nationalists on the one hand. Um, between 2000 and about 2000 to 2006, 2007, and probably ongoing now, Mein Kampf was a bestseller in Turkey. There is a nationalist, a radical nationalist wing, and they could be secular, and sometimes they have an Islamist tint toward them. 
there's that group. Then there's the other group, um, the Islamists. Turkey can become, can implode under these two passions. The secular, liberal Turks who want a, um, a Turkey that resembles Sweden are increasingly in the minority. The same applies to Indonesia, but over time things could change. My greatest fear is that Iran is going to bait Israel and the United States and plunge the world into a nuclear war. Another fear I have is that Pakistan, that is already a nuclear power, that has a secret service with two faces, on the one hand pretending to comply with America and her allies, on the other hand working extensively with the Taliban, is also going to plunge um, as into a nuclear war, especially with India as you know the great rival, the great eternal enemy. So the world could, in the name of Islam, fall into um, a very, very violent confrontation if we don't wake up to it and tell a demography which is very young, the 1.57 billion people I've talked about are all very young. You look at all Muslim countries and most of their populations, sometimes 70%, sometimes 80%, are in those critical ages that it matters for men between 15 years of age to 30 years of age, those violent ages. And if those men don't have employment, don't have a program in life, then they're easily recruited by all kinds of wrong groups. Let's, what I'd like to do is just go through quickly what you're actually advocating. I mean, just on a... Because clearly there's the, that great geopolitical issue, yeah. which are, but there's not a whole lot that we can do about Iran at this stage. But what you're talking about is how you tackle Islam at home, how you actually establish Western Enlightenment values, aren't no, you? I'm talking about both. Yeah. OK, we'll talk about the second. Um, Banning the veil, do you advocate that? I don't. And the reason, I, I think the veil is a restrictive, terrible symbol. It is, I mean, I, I can't condemn the veil um, enough. But banning it, in my view, is not the answer. I think the best thing to do um, is to have, in a Western society, the best thing to do is to have a debate about the substance. What does the veil stand for? What is the likelihood of Sharia law or parts of Sharia law being introduced, for instance, into Australian society? That is what the debate should be about. If you're going to have a debate about the presence of Islam in Australian society and you understand Islam as it is representing a religious dimension, which I think is fine. You can practice in a liberal democracy. You can have, you know, you can pray five times a day. You can fast your foods or go to Mecca one, if you can afford it once in a year or whenever. That's all fine. That's the religious dimension of Islam. But Islam has two other dimensions. There's the political dimension where the concept of jihad and Sharia law is central. And there is a social dimension that governs the relationship between men and women. Now, if you want to start a debate about how does that social dimension and that political dimension fit into a liberal society like Australia, then you better have that debate and don't just have a debate about a very, very small symbol like the burqa or the face covering. Because if you do have the face covering, this is what's amazing about Australia. I come at a time when there are elections. People really want to have, the population wants to have a debate about culture and the clash of civilizations, and particularly the clash between Islamic values on the one hand and Australian values on the other hand. And the leadership, the politicians are having a, having a cosmetic debate about immigration and about a big Australian, about an, a small Australia, but that's not what the debate is about. If you want to learn anything about Europe, what is it, what are the mistakes that Europe made? The mistakes that Europe made is exactly what you're seeing. They trivialized the debate. They talked about burqas, they talked about minarets, and they're having, they're caught in a quagmire 
of burqas and minarets. They're not talking about the substance. And the substance is that clash of values. And when you do have a clash of values, there is no compromise. How do you impose values? Yeah. Yeah. How, how can you... I mean, we, we had a prime minister for this one who who wanted to try and impose values. Now, it was, it was ridiculed because one of them was a famous cricket captain and everyone rolled their eyes and said, well, that's a silly thing. But in fact, what he was trying to talk about was a values. Um, and he got laughed out of court um, and the government lost for other reasons. But um, how do you impose values? How do you make Muslims have a debate when, as you say in the Quran, if you, if you follow it totally, there's no question about do I or don't I wear a veil. You must, because that's the way it's been interpreted by the imams and that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. So how does the debate happen? Well, the debate happens, first of all, if you, and I think you do in Australia, you already subscribe to the value system of the rule of law, of freedom, of tolerance, of equality. You know the list. It's not just a list that you make everybody learn by heart and then say, oh, when a Muslim comes along, we are going to uh, seed all of that. No, this is what Australia is about. This is what many European countries, the United States is all about. You don't impose it, it's already imposed. Now, one thing we know about human beings is these, uh, the rule of law and democracy and the values that are a part of democracy are not genetic. You're not born with them, you learn them. So the education system implies that you teach young people about these values. If a contra system or people, individuals who want to introduce a contra system come along and they say, no, we don't want to teach them about democracy, we want to introduce to young people a value system that is very different, then I would say, no way, not here in Australia. Immigrants who come, and I'm not an Australian, but I'm assuming you live in a free society and you do want to keep and maintain and preserve that freedom for all, not only for white people, but for all people who are Australians. Mm. Now, if you do that and you also accept the fact that immigration is a matter of choice, no one is forcing anybody to come from countries where Sharia law is the system to come and establish themselves in countries that have secular laws, man-made laws. Sharia law is a divine law derived from the Quran. You have secular law. You take an airplane or a boat or a car. You come to this country. You know it's a sec of a secular law and you want to change it. I don't think that there's anything wrong and it's very reasonable if the authorities here say, make a legal U-turn if you want to live in a Sharia state. If that's what you want to do, you, have, you, know, you are free to do that. We will allow the religious dimension of your faith, we're not going to allow the social and the political dimension, and you don't only say it, you've got to mean it and enforce it. If you don't do it, you're going to look like the Netherlands. Mm. If, we'll be asking questions shortly, so if you'd like to, in about five minutes, if you'd like to move yourselves um, to the aisles, that feel welcome, but we'll continue. To have, do you... Um, you're talking about a, a test for loyalty for, for refugees. Should they be should they be asked if they're prepared to sign up to the values of the country to which they're um, applying? If you recognize a refugee as an individual human being, a fellow individual human being, regardless of where he or she comes from, in search of an opportunity to build for himself or herself a better life, and you say, given the culture that we have and the laws that we have in Australia, we will give you that opportunity. All you have to do is sign up. Do you think that you could commit, that you could be loyal to be a part of this society and preserve our culture of freedom? Do you think that you could do that? And if we replace the asylum processing system that we have now in place in most free societies, in all free societies, with a system that in those interviews asks these questions with the security clip in there that says if you do not 
we have the discretion to send you back to wherever it is that you came from. I think that system is more honest. I think it's going to work for both parties instead of having this, again, uh, cosmetic dichotomy between economic refugees and political refugees and all the stuff you know that you have now because of the convention. It's not, pe pe you have 40 million people in the world who are asylum seekers, refugees, displaced peoples, in search of a better life. A country like Australia is not only driven by a compassion to help those people out, a country like Australia is also driven by self-interest in needing immigrants to come in as producers, consumers, and contributors to society. And therein, I see a wonderful exchange between those individuals who want to contribute and a society that needs them, but that can give them rights and an opportunity to build a wonderful life. And I think it's very, very, very important to be explicit about that. To be very, very explicit about that and knowing that you can break that uh, contract and that breaking of the contract, if it comes from the other side, um, that you can send people back and say, we are, you know, there are 40 million people around. If you don't want to take I think advantage of this opportunity, get lost. I mean, I mean yeah. I, well, uh, what about what about desperate asylum seekers who, I suppose, uh, do we expect them to sign a pledge of loyalty? To them to sign up? All they want to do is actually get their children out of a war zone, but they don't want to give up their faith. No, but again, desperation, human desperation, is something that, for those of us who are not in a situation of desperation, we should be moved to help. Uh, I referred to the time I went to the border between Kenya and Somalia, and I saw the desperation of people coming in, and I wanted to help. I wanted to do everything I could do, and realized my limits. There was very little I could do. There is more that Australia can do for those people who are extremely desperate. But desperation is not an argument to undermine this society and what the people who have contributed to this society for decades have built for themselves. You could say you are in a desperate position. We want to offer you an opportunity to come out of that desperation, but there are conditions for that. The point I want to make is that desperate individual, male or female, has a choice. He or she can say, given the values that you're proposing, no, I would rather invest in the hereafter and stay in my camp and die because I know I'm going to wake up after I die and I'm going to have a wonderful life. Or he or she can say, I'm going to come to Australia and I'm going to learn what it takes to be a successful contributor to this society, what the laws are, what the values are, what the customs are, what the habits, I'm going to invest, I'm going to really throw myself in that. And I know as a first generation, I may not get far, but I could get my children and my grandchildren to become great contributors to this society and have wonderful lives. That's what immigration used to be about. First generation, had it always very difficult. The second generation, a little easier. The third generation was completely assimilated. And that has been perverted by the politically, politically con correct um, people to mean we're going to feel sorry for people. We're going to bring them here. We're not going to teach them about the values of our society. There are radical Muslims poaching for their loyalty criminals poaching for their loyalty. There are all kinds of threats, and they're exposed to all of that. And we want to keep saying we need more people to come in so that we can feel good about ourselves. We can offer them nothing. There is an opposition to immigrants coming in. There is a huge deal of tension and instability. And the result of that, unfortunately, is people fleeing unstable countries might end up 10, 20 years from now coming to unstable countries. You make the whole world unstable mm. if you use that philosophy. 
Um, are there questions? Does, if you'd like to question, I'd just like to make one point. I mean, this is the hottest of hot potatoes for our politicians. I mean, they simply will not. I mean, it was a very interesting, I don't know if, um, if who else heard it, but there was a report quite recently, in fact, in Sydney, a group of doctors were saying as a way of dealing um, with genital mutilation, which was happening in this country, it happens secretly, it's illegal, of course, that they, a way of advancing it, rather than making it more difficult and absolutely holding up every legal obstacle, that they should acknowledge a lesser procedure called the NIC yeah. and that they should legitimise this so um, it wouldn't be so bad. But the idea of actually saying no, not under any circumstances, is wrong yeah. in this country um, was not considered. So it was, it's, it's a very hot issue here. It's difficult. Sir. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, talk. Um, those of us who have read Infidel, uh, were, I speak personally, were very, very moved by your courage and the story that you told about coming to the West. I have a simple question. After all the experience you've had and the stubbornness of the people who have criticised you, and I think of Hilary McPhee, who's one of Australia's leading commentariat in the guise of promoting this talk tonight, gave a very, very nasty critical review, which I'm very proud to say I defended in public, and it's on the Wheeler website. I just want to ask you, I just want to ask you, what in your personal opinion um, brings people so stubbornly to not understand the exact sorts of threats that you're talking about. What is the perver because I have arguments with people about this, and you obviously do all the time, and you're attacked all the time. What is it about the nature of the comment, the left commentariat in particular, that simply wants to defend at all costs? And the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting. Can we move on to the question? Yeah. Well, what what do you feel is the the, the very nature and the personality? and the impetus behind these people who refuse such obvious, uh, self-evident um, remarks that you make? And why are you attacked in such a way? By the West, by people who aren't intimidated by the terrorists directly. So the question is, what is it do I think that makes people um, accommodate the demands made, for instance, by radical Muslims, and why is it that people are oblivious um, to the threat posed by radical Islam. Yes, it's a type of, we're submitting to a type of dimitude. Yes, that's exactly the question. Yeah, uh, dimis, I'm not, I'm not going to explain dimitude, but you know, why is it that people are oblivious? There are so many answers possible, but the most um, prominent and the most established is if we give Muslim minorities, and the assumption is that all Muslim minorities want it, but if we accommodate the demands made by radical Muslims, they are going to feel that they are at home, they will not feel rejected, they will not feel that they are the victims of racism or Islamophobia, and if they feel at home and comfortable, uh, pretty soon, they're going to acquaint themselves with the values of liberal democracy and they're going to adopt them. And for the receiving society to make assimilation or integration successful, all that they need to do is to be A, patient, and B, accommodate, accommodate, accommodate. And why is that not true? That is not true because it ignores such factors as the people from Muslim countries who come here, most of them are really not radicalized. They get radicalized in free societies. In the UK, men like the Finsbury Mosque Imam, whose name I now forget, were allowed in on the basis of religious persecution. He couldn't preach in Egypt. There were so many preachers of the most radical forms of Islam in Muslim countries who are persecuted in their own countries and come to the West 
and find new audiences. And the new audiences that they target are usually very vulnerable people, displaced peoples who, yes, have a hard time adjusting to modernity, especially the modernity in the receiving societies. And instead of the receiving society investing energy and resources in teaching them about the values of freedom and democracy and individualism, etc., it's all outsourced to organized groups who say, we are going to help them adjust, but they don't help them adjust. That theory is also wrong because it ignores the worldwide movement, sometimes top-down, meaning from the states, sometimes bottom-up, that um, is promoting political Islam as the answer to political um, dilemmas. Um, all societies are faced with economic challenges, military challenges, political challenges, and the Islamists are promoting a worldview that Islam has the answer to all of that. If you already identify yourself as a Muslim, even though you don't practice it, and you're approached by an agent of radical political Islam, and he says, for things to change for you and for things to change in the world, join my caravan, it's easier to join the caravan of the familiar, especially if no one else offers you anything else. So that's another argument. Okay, but whatever cool. the argument is, it is not true, it is wrong, and I think it's also very, very dangerous. So I just think there's quite a lot of people asking questions. I was gonna, could, could we, so, up there. So if we could, if, with respect, if we could make the questions direct questions, that would be more likely then to be able to all have a go. Okay. Uh, my name's Henk uh, van Leeuwen. I'm from Holland as an immigrant many years ago. My question is related to the solution, the answers that must lie in nonviolent political action. And I so much appreciate and respect your own education and having been a member of parliament in the Netherlands. I've lived in this country and I'm very politically aware Look, please, what, sir, I mean, what, it's, what not, it's simply not fair to all the other people who are waiting. Please get to my, your point. My question is, do you think that in um, a country such as the Netherlands, where politically uh, many things through consensus are possible, there is a very good chance, as an example of democracy, to take direct, non-violent, legal, political action to intervene? Well, today I think that that is possible if a consensus can be found by the three parties or four parties that you could say are the largest after the election in June 2008. Uh, we've had elections in the Netherlands in June, 8 June. We still don't have a government because the three or four different largest parties don't want to form a coalition and they can't form a coalition, they can form a coalition on differences in the economy, in the environment, in their relationship to the EU, but they don't seem, and this has been going on for decades, to form a coalition to answer the question of Islam and the Netherlands. That's when I say it can this issue can turn a country like the Netherlands that was very liberal, very free, into an ungovernable entity. That's what I mean. So today, the possibility of solving this problem through peaceful means is still there. 10 years from now, when the demographics change and when people get really hardened and lose confidence in the political system and the political leadership and take to the streets and confront one another, like the former Yugoslavia, things might get really out of hand and that's what we need to prevent. Yes. Ayan, possibly one of the most common criticisms directed against you is that you provide full, uh, fuel for racists. Uh, that, that somehow by standing up as a, as a Muslim woman and criticising Islam so strongly that you somehow validate some of the unfortunate hand in hand of criticising Islam and criticising Muslims. Uh, how do you answer that? 
I answer that by pointing out to the fact that Islam is not a race. Islam is a belief system. If you look at people who identify themselves as Muslims, you see that they are made up of very many different races. Uh, I mean, that is if you subscribe to the notion that uh, humanity has different races. But <laughs> there are black Muslims, there are white Muslims, there are converts to Islam, they come from Asia, they come from Africa, they come from Europe. So Islam is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multilingual belief system. Because it's a belief system, the accusation of racism simply does not apply. People who use that are using that as an instrument to distract our attention from scrutinizing Islam as a belief system, as a political philosophy, as a social philosophy. So racism simply does not apply. Now if you scrutinize Islam as a political and a social system, what you find out is concentrated in it is a system of bigotry. Islam makes a distinction between believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers are subordinate to believers. They have to be converted to uniformity, to become Muslims through persuasion, da'wah, or through jihad by the sword. The position between men and women in Islam is different. Women are subordinate to men. That is bigotry. Homosexuals are supposed to be treated as sick people and killed when Sharia law is finally established, which is the ideal of Islamists. That is bigotry. Black people in Islamist nations are treated as slaves and slavery is condoned in Islam. That is bigotry. The more you look at the philosophy for life in Islam, Islam as a political theory, the more bigoted it is. So that's how I answer it. It is really ridiculous to defy a political system of bigotry by telling people you are bigoted simply because it's practiced by brown men. I'm sorry, I'm not bigoted, Islam is bigoted. And the most important thing, the most important message for humanity, for those 1.57 billion people, is to emancipate themselves, not from the past imperialism of the white man, but from the bigotry that is embedded in Islam. I'm really sorry, we're only gonna have time to take two more and they have to be quick. Because it is, it is, time is moving on. Yes. Yes, I'd, I'd just like to ask a question about uh, the importance of the military history of Islam, because I think it's often overlooked. If I might just quickly say that uh, I'm John Perkins of the Secular Party and we have issued a statement yesterday endorsing your statement. But first, about I, the I, I question, can't hear, yes. We can't hear it, so can you just, what was the question? <clears throat> the question is about the military history of Islam. I think that uh, the, the, the role of the prophet as a military leader is often overlooked and it's, it seems to be uh, a very important role given that it's the duty of Muslims to emulate the prophet. What do you think about the importance of the role of the military history in that respect? So the question, if I'm going to paraphrase just to see if I hear you well, is um, the military role of the prophet. Um, you're asking me what that is and what it means for Islam today. Yes, given the prophet led a, a military rebellion from Medina against the people of Mecca mm -hmm. to establish Islam in the first place, and that is built into the history of Islam and the Quran itself, uh, do you see the important, that is an important role in the motivation for terrorism, for example, in Islam? So, within Islam you have um, clerics, imams who say, or who limit the exemplary role of the Prophet Muhammad to the first years in Mecca. And when Muhammad founded Islam, in the first years that he spent in Mecca, uh, those years were had nothing to do with military or with fighting. He preached about kindness, generosity. He 
He preached about hospitality. He preached about unifying uh, all the different warring factions of that, those desert Arab tribes instead of worshiping different gods to worship one god, and that one god was benign. Later on, years later, after he had been to Abyssinia and in Medina, when he had a large enough following and he was able to build a militia, his role from being a spiritual leader changed to being, becoming a military leader. And he started to conduct raids into Mecca and into other places and expanded Islam. So he became a general, essentially. And many of the radical Islamists of today, like bin Laden, refer back to the time of Muhammad as a military leader, spreading Islam by the sword as fast as he could and killing uh, all those people that didn't want to defy, uh, didn't want to convert to Islam. The Sufis, for instance, hark back to the Meccan period and say the Prophet Muhammad, we, we should only follow his example uh, in his Meccan uh, period. Professors like experts, Muslim experts like Bernard Lewis, when they are confronted with the question, can Islam be reformed, um, reformed, say, to the extent of Christianity, can it reconcile itself with modernity, with peace, with a secular um, government, uh, always points out to the fact that if Muslims were to follow the Quranic chapters and verses that were revealed in Mecca, then that separation between church and state is possible. But unfortunately, the surahs, the chapters and verses in Medina abrogate the ones in Mecca. So Muhammad as a symbol, as a military symbol, as a, and as a conqueror, uh, in the imagination of most Muslims today, uh, is predominant and is in the way of uh, becoming, you know, stands in the way of reformation and in the way of a symbolic, peaceful, peace-loving prophet. I'm very conscious people have um, dinners to get to and... Uh, uh, appointments and babysitters and whatever. So if there will be one, this will be the one last question. Please keep it tight. Um, Thank in, you. Uh, in your book, you suggest that Christian organisations uh, head into Muslim communities and evangelise. Uh, given that most of the Christian organisations that do evangelise are pretty fundamentalist, wouldn't you just be replacing one fundamentalist ideology with another? <laughs> I like the applause. <laughs> and I want to challenge those people who are applauding how they think that they can um, challenge radical Islam in schools, in Muslim centers. You know, how can we win the hearts and minds of those 1.57 billion people to believe in something else other than what the radical Muslims are proselytizing because they are winning the argument and they're working hard to do it. And yes, there are Christians who are radical. There are Christians who are, uh, I wouldn't say just as, because they're absolutely not as violent, but intolerant and narrow in their thinking. But that is not the Christianity that I have seen. I know that there is also established Christianity. I had lunch this afternoon with uh, Bishop Rob Forsyth. And the Christianity that he represents, the Christianity that m many people like him represent, today is dormant. They are not going after that demography. They are not challenging the principles and the premises of the radical Islamists. And many people within that demography do not want to become atheists. That is a reality I've come to accept. So given that fact, there would be nothing wrong and in fact everything right and maybe a better alternative to military wars, to bombings and law enforcement officials to compete for the hearts and minds of those 1.57 billion people in every way we can. The Christian churches, the Catholic churches and the Protestant churches, the moderate ones, are already established and know how to do that. They're just being intimidated either by the PC people or people like you who think that they're all radical. 
And I think that we should stop doing that. I think that they should start competing. If we don't compete, we run the risk of being engulfed, living in a global order where the radical Muslims win the hearts and minds simply because there's no one else competing with them. And if you want to know how that works, look at the genesis of Hezbollah. Look at the establishment of kindergartens where children, children, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, are taught to hate and to invest in and hereafter. Look at the boarding schools that are established in places like Germany and Holland by radical Islamist Turks teaching their children that all they have to care about is jihad and the hereafter. And if you see how that is expanding and there is no, nothing in front of, no way, those of us who believe in the enlightenment are not competing, the Christians are not competing, the communists are not competing, that leads us to a situation where we are going to have an army of Islamists who are now very young, but who are mobilized to fight in the jihad. And I don't think that that's what we want to do, because if we get to that position, that means only military confrontation. So if we want to avoid military conf uh, confrontation, let us get into the business of converting. Um, Ayan Hasiali will now be uh, signing books. Uh, many of these issues that she's been talking about, specifically the role, the potential role of the Christian church and of feminists as active uh, organs to try and um, convert or uh, certainly uh, um, have a role um, inside Islam. It's, it's a fascinating book. It's out there in the lobby now. I think that we should just... I want to ask one question before we let... I and her Ciali go, which is this. I've noticed in the last year or so, because um, you very rarely write about anything much personal, it's, um, you know, you're a very philosophical and political uh, phenomenon, really. Uh, you've talked about wanting a child. You've said you'd love to have a child. Yeah. How the heaven are you going to do that? How the hell are you going to do that? How in any world are you going to do that? Uh, well, how... Do with with a, with a, with the security, <laughs> I don't mean the actual physical, but with the security detail and the kind of life you lead. How are you? Well, I think the security details might help with the babysitting. <laughs> <laughs>